We come now to the final presentation of our <coughs> 1969 Nobel Lecture, in which Dr. Eric Lenneberg is to speak to us on the word between us. I'm intrigued, as I think you are, by the title which Dr. Lenneberg has given to this lecture, A Word Between Us. It recalled to my mind an illustration used by the German theologian philosopher Karl Heim quite a few years ago. He said, we cannot get to know people directly. It's as though each of us were clothed in a giant hoop skirt which prevented us from getting next to one another. We become aware of one another, not at the center of our being, but at the boundary of our awareness. We encounter another activity on the part of that other hoop skirt, which seems to be like the activity of our own hoop skirt, and surmise, therefore, that it is caused by a self-conscious being like ourselves. That is as close as we come to one another, except that we can throw a word into that other circle, and <coughs> that other word or that word becomes the point of contact with the other. And so the word between us establishes community and fellowship. Now a word about Dr. Lineberg. His education makes him some sort of a native of three continents. His elementary education was received in Germany, where he was born. His high school years were spent in Brazil, followed by seven years in the business world there, then two years in the U.S. Army, graduate studies at the University of Chicago, in linguistics and at Harvard in psychology and linguistics, and further studies in the neurosciences at Harvard Medical School. From 1959 to 69, he taught psychology at the Harvard Medical School and Children's Hospital. And from 1960 to 66, he was a member of the faculty department of psychology at Harvard University. He has also taught at the University of Michigan and is now at Cornell University, occupying a chair as professor of psychology and neurobiology. It's clear that his training and experience give him a very broad base in both the biological and psychological dis disciplines, in addition to lo ling linguistics, and consequently he has a very broad base for the discussion of language and learning. We'll now be privileged to hear him speak on a word between us. Dr. Lenneman. There's nothing obvious about the nature of language. In fact, the proper study of language and objective view of language is as difficult as to study or to obtain a, an objective view of our own retina or of uh, sensing, perceiving the motion of the planet on which we live. Uh, I believe that we cannot understand language unless we uh, sit in our armchairs and think very hard about language and its circumstances, uh, which certainly does not exclude that we also ought to do empirical research. Now, this point of view is very much against the spirit of uh, present-day biological research as well as psychological research. In fact, um, I would like to quote to you a sentence which I've taken from the report that you heard about yesterday from Dr. Mahler, 
uh, namely the report by Alan and Beatrice Gardner on their, in connection with their efforts to teach uh, the chimpanzee Washo uh, English. And they say that the theories on language, and I quote, that can be constructed are never as interesting as the natural phenomena themselves. And the gathering of data is a self-justifying activity. They also feel that um, there are two ways of doing research on language. One way is scholarship. There's reference in friends uh, to my own name. And there's an alternative way, which is their way, and which is obviously what they think is the correct way, uh, and that they think is different from mine, namely that you do direct empirical research and um, you simply take a chimpanzee and try to teach it a human language. And they uh, use these two words, human and language. So clearly, they are also interested on, uh, in unraveling the nature of language, human language, and uh, by implication, as we heard from Dr. Chomsky, also the nature <laughs> of cognition of the brain. Now, uh, it is just barely possible that uh, in the absence of thinking about language, in the absence of that scholarship, which they uh, talk about with considerable disdain, that uh, you may fool yourself and be uh, doing something to the animal which only resembles language in very superficial ways, and therefore that whatever result they achieve uh, can be easily misrepresented or misinterpreted because what they have been teaching the animal might not have been language, in fact. And they deal with this uh, to some extent, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, excuse is something like uh, this that language, human language, is simply one extreme of a continuum and that you find points all the way down this continuum, uh, presumably down to the amoeba. They don't mention that, but it's my own free comment. Well, uh, I think uh, we, first of all, want to have a preliminary definition, at least a definition for the way I am going to use here uh, the notions language communication. If I use the words language communication, uh, I uh, imply thereby that two conditions hold. The first condition is that there are two individuals who communicate and that they communicate because there is substantial agreement between the two on the interpretation of the sentences produced by either one of them, that they can agree between them, there's agreement, demonstrable agreement, on the interpretation of the sentences. We may add semantic interpretation to this. That's the first condition. The second condition is that the sentences that are being produced uh, can be judged by a speech community as being representative, or better perhaps as being based on a natural language, and by this I mean English, Turkish, Navajo, and so on. So these are the two conditions. Uh, you may ask, uh, how do we know if the two speakers, two individuals, agree on interpretation? What is the procedure that we have to follow to find out whether they, in fact, do agree? Well, we could, uh, for instance, stipulate that some of these sentences be propositions. The sun is shining. Uh, this is a large room, things of this sort. And uh, both speakers can be required to uh, evaluate the truth value of these propositions. Is it correct? Is it true? Or is it false? And if they both judge the sentence to be true in the present circumstance, they have both attributed the same truth value to these propositions, and there is one aspect of agreement. Or you may have a, an imperative, a commandment of some sort, instruction, uh, uh, say, uh, Jimmy, take your shoe out of Johnny's mouth, and uh, if they both uh, agree on what is involved uh, demonstrably, uh, then there is agreement uh, between the interpretation of this imperative. 
The second condition is uh, purposely formulated uh, very vaguely, I say based on a natural language. Uh, all too often we find that uh, the non-expert on language uh, believes that linguists or scientists concerned with language, scholars, uh, interpret language as being exclusively oral, both oral OR and oral AUR, um, and that it has to be articulated with lips, tongue, and so on. But this is not the case at all. Uh, based on a natural language merely means that some production system exists uh, which has or bears an isomorphism to the production system which is called a natural language, or that sentences in one system uh, can be related point by point to sentences in the other language. An example of this would be Morse code, where uh, in fact every signal corresponds to a letter, uh, and this then would be written language, and in turn the written form corresponds very exactly to an oral form. Or a semaphore system might be another example, uh, which might occasionally uh, constitute some forms of abbreviation. You may leave out uh, grammatical endings, maybe, inflections, and so on. But this, then, is merely a degraded version of a natural language. There is still a maybe not perfect isomorphism, but you have a good correspondence still uh, between uh, this production system and the sentences that it produces and a natural language. Well, uh, let me uh, now uh, state the conditions under which we could study language communication. And uh, I will uh, go through this in, by five points, mentioning five points, uh, which would be essentially the steps or the kinds of things you want to do if you were to run an experiment on uh, the test question, is there language communication or not? Uh, we will also uh, consider, uh, and, and on purpose, uh, set up our test situation, our hypothetical experiment, in such a way that it could be applied to a wide variety of situations to different individuals, where individual might be an animal, for all we know. So we are not prejudging language to be necessarily bound to human beings, although I might as well anticipate, in the end, uh, I want to convince you that I personally believe that the word probably only can refer to the transactions that take place between human beings. But um, the experiment that we are now constructing, uh, and in a sense going to be performed as a Gedanken experiment here, uh, is designed to be applicable uh, to a variety of situations. The first step that we want to uh, observe is a test on the uh, communication medium or on the language itself. Uh, if we have a system, let it be fingerspelling or some kind of signal system which is uh, uh, received through the visual modality, uh, we would like to know what is, uh, can be transmitted over this system. And if we are humans, uh, I have no objections in this case, that on both ends we have uh, an, a human being and we uh, make them communicate with each other and we will simply explore now the dimensions of the communication system. After all, man has many different types of communication systems. Some have practically nothing to do with natural languages. Some are deformations and degradations of language. Some are isomorphic with language. Uh, if you... Uh, would like, we could continue on uh, to uh, deride or to criticize uh, the gardeners as straw men, although this is not an exercise to um, uh, belittle the work of others. Uh, if we uh, have a system with which we communicate, let us say uh, with the dolphins, we would uh, require that the humans uh, themselves first be 
guinea pigs in our experiment, uh, uh, let it be uh, John Lilly and his wife, uh, who has been talking to dolphins quite actively in the last uh, five years. Uh, and uh, we uh, would run this experiment in the following way. Uh, we, um, is this thing on now? Uh, can it be heard in the, in the room? It sounds as if I was speaking to the Can you hear me now? I think I better. Can I be heard, be, be heard now? Okay. Uh, the experiment that would be necessary now uh, to test the communication medium itself would be roughly like this. We have an experimenter, E, who writes on a slip of paper the message that he would like to have sent through the communication system. And I write over this arrow P for paper. And here you have the first subject, which is one human being, uh, who now signals to another human being right here. And he uses the signal system of his choice. Uh, let it be finger spelling. Uh, the second subject would now uh, communicate to E, again by writing on a piece of paper uh, what uh, has been, what uh, he has received. Uh, this can be the same person, can be the same slip of paper if you wish. So by this uh, setup, we will find out what the system itself is capable of doing. And we can find out whether there is, in fact, the isomorphism uh, that we are ideally requiring if we are to judge that uh, a human language is being taught to an animal. Then we would have to find out whether, uh, in fact, uh, what goes on here has the same uh, uh, transmission capacities as language. All right. Uh, this, then, was a step on a test on uh, the medium itself. Uh, my uh, next requirement uh, is going to be a little bit more complicated. Caught here. Uh, in that um, now we want to find out whether uh, the uh, other partner in the communication system, uh, a chimpanzee, uh, does in fact understand what is being transmitted over the system that we have already developed. And our setup would be roughly like this. We have again E, who writes on a slip of paper uh, what uh, the first subject is to transmit. Uh, the chimpanzee does something. But we will require that one observer uh, watches what is being said. And he has to write on a slip of paper what he thinks was being said. In addition, we have a second observer who watches the chimpanzee but does not know what uh, the first subject, what this subject has actually been saying. Uh, preferably, this observer will buzz, will send some kind of a signal uh, at the end of the message so that this subject knows when to begin observing the animal because presumably the animal is acting and moving all the time. Uh, when the buzzer has sounded, this observer begins to observe the chimpanzee and he then writes down what the chimpanzee is doing. Now, why is it necessary to have this rather complicated setup? Turns out that it is extremely difficult to decide whether the recipient is, in fact, communicating with you in language. Uh, this problem has come up many times clinically in research um, on humans, uh, research that I conducted over a number of years, where you have a child who seems to be reacting appropriately, but uh, this is a very different question uh, from the one whether he's understanding what you say, whether he knows English. Uh, it is very much like the story we heard this morning of the psychiatrist who was uh, giving solace uh, to the lady, bereaved lady. Um, the lady did respond. She responded quite appropriately. 
but she did not know the language. Uh, this problem comes up again and again. It comes up particularly in the case of observing animals where many people are thoroughly convinced that their favorite lap dog uh, does know um, uh, everything that uh, his uh, doting um, owner says. Uh, some people have assured me that they have to spell out every word because the cat really knows when she talks about milk. Uh, and you can't fool yourself. You can, uh, therefore, you have to have a rather sophisticated uh, system in which to uh, test the situation. Uh, test number three is, uh, or objective number three, is the question of whether the uh, subject knows the language and isn't responding uh, to other cues. Uh, and uh, we would proceed in the following way. First of all, the first rule of our experiment is that any spontaneously produced, unsolicited signal emission from our subject, from the, in this case the chimpanzee, if you wish, or from the child about whom you know nothing, all spontaneously emitted signals are going to be ignored. This may st strike you as very strange. In fact, it's almost the opposite of what's, what had been reported and discussed yesterday. The reason it is absolutely essential that we ignore the spontaneous activities, spontaneous emission, is that we as human observers can always fit interpretations to almost anything that goes on. And that is precisely the reason why it took a long time for us to convince ourselves that animals don't speak uh, ordinarily, that trees don't speak. Uh, we always have a feeling uh, that there is meaning in everything around us. Uh, this is uh, relevant to the situation of interpreting what an animal who knows some uh, signals uh, wants to say for the following reason. Supposing uh, I have the subject right here next to me and suddenly the subject makes the sign for dog and I look around and I find no dog, is it therefore a signal? Uh, am I now to in interpret that the dog, that the chimpanzee doesn't know language, not necessarily. I can easily say he must be thinking of a dog. Maybe he's asking me, go and get me, get me a dog. Uh, maybe he's saying, I just uh, uh, heard a dog barking. And I may remember that, in fact, 10 minutes ago, a dog did bark and so on. So clearly, uh, the produced, spontaneously produced signals are no clue for us whatsoever. Uh, I would not even want to uh, be too sure that the spoken uh, answers to my questions are uh, the data on which I must base myself. But the only safe method would be to give instructions to the animal and see whether it follows those and then formulate those instructions in uh, various grammatical ways or to ask the animal or the subject questions to which it can answer yes or no. And uh, it does not have to do this in language. It can do this for yes and this for no. This incidentally has been uh, done successfully several times with children who have no ability whatever to use their articulatory organs, who are mute, and who can be demonstrated uh, to be in possession of language. Uh, my fourth uh, requirement for a proper research on language uh, would be uh, that the language to be used is somewhat simplified. Now, uh, you will very soon see that this requirement has actually various questionable aspects to it. I have written on the blackboard uh, a sample language, and the words that I've used are taken as far as I could from the repertoire of the words that presumably uh, Washoe, the chimpanzee raised by the gardeners, has. Half of these words uh, they report uh, the, uh, are in possession of this animal. Now, altogether, there are only 20 items on the blackboard, and they report that the animal has now spun 
uh, utters spontaneously or uses spontaneously, uh, I think, 36 items and has an understanding vocabulary of even more, would be quite sufficient to have as few as, say, 20 items. But they would have to be items of a certain kind. It is not quite sufficient that the animal merely responds to a specific class of words which uh, <laughs> correspond to, for instance, uh, what he is to do. Uh, I might stand there and say, hop, and the animal jumps on the table. That is, in a sense, uh, a word for jump on the table. But conceivably, I may say again, hop, and the animal jumps down from the table, and I can run him through various paces. Clearly, this has nothing whatsoever to do with language. Uh, it is essential that certain minimum relationships are being expressed because those are typical of language, and we will have much more to say about that uh, presently. Uh, for the time being, I, will, I would like to ask you to look at these words and convince yourself that of the wealth of sentences you could make, but especially of imperatives and questions. So the language might not consist of any more than simply a few uh, instructions of what the animal is to do um, and of um, uh, also questions uh, that it has to answer. Now, lastly, we want to be sure that there's some aspect of productivity in what the animal or the subject uh, is doing. It is not enough that we demonstrate that either a child or an animal has a bag of tricks. This we know already. We don't have to do any experiment on that. Uh, horses and uh, chimpanzees and dogs do a great number of tricks, uh, up into 80 different kinds of things, uh, nothing of which has anything to do with language. So uh, the productivity that I require is that uh, we introduce a never-ending variety of objects, namely uh, any kind of brush, and every time a new brush comes, uh, the animal knows that that's another brush, and all the way down, I used some uh, words that are furniture or rooms that the animal could speak the language in any room. It does not have to be uh, confined to a specific room, presumably even uh, to different um, speakers of the language. This is what I mean by uh, productivity. Now, uh, I have defined a bit what I mean by language communication, and I have given you a sample of a language tremendously oversimplified, and you might even argue that what I have on the board and what you can do with it is so simple that it barely even shares in the characteristics of natural languages, but uh, let that be as it may. Let us go on and look now um, at human material, at patients uh, with various kinds of diseases uh, that um, affect language, and find out what is essential in man, biologically essential in man, for language knowledge to form itself, to exist. Uh, the first uh, type of patient I'd like to introduce are patients with sensory deficits, particularly the deaf, congenitally deaf children. They are uh, not exposed to language, they can hear nothing, uh, can they acquire language? There's no question whatsoever that they can, but the medium through which you'd have to bring language to them would have to be different. Uh, in the older days, uh, these individuals were trained by reading and writing, introducing reading and writing at a very early time, and uh, uh, perfectly good uh, language development was noted uh, nowadays, uh, a good deal of experimentation has taken place with lip reading and teaching the deaf to uh, use the articulators in such a way that they might make noises that you can understand. This has not been very successful. However, the, that they know a natural language that you can communicate with them in a natural language, that there's language communication, can be amply documented uh, by reading and writing. Secondly, let's look at the blind, congenitally blind children. No question whatsoever that blindness is no obstacle to language acquisition. I have, uh, all of these examples are really 
uh, not taken from books. I have done studies on each one of these cases. I've uh, surveyed many, many uh, households of deaf individuals, studied uh, congenitally deaf children from the cradle from uh, during the first few weeks of their birth and followed them for several years and have done the same thing recently with a congenitally blind child. The blind children learn to speak at exactly the same time that other children uh, begin to speak and develop uh, language without any difficulties, whatever. Something which immediately gives us pause to think about one aspect of nature, namely the association between sight and uh, audition, uh, what you see and what you hear. If blind children have such an easy time in learning to speak, it does not look very much as if language depended on this type of uh, visual and auditory association. Uh, further, children who have various deficits in the oral cavity have been studied, uh, and there can be no question whatsoever that there's, this does not constitute an obstacle to language acquisition. Therefore, uh, one aspect of the reasoning for teaching the chimpanzee Sign language is quite superfluous because you have in man individuals who can also not use their articulators, and you have individuals who can also pay no attention to what is being said. So these conditions, if they exist in, prime, in other primates, non-human primates, also exist in some individuals in man. But in contrast to man, um, in the chimpanzee, you seem to have considerable difficulty in teaching them to read and write. At, uh, Non-articulating children have no difficulties in learning English, even though they may never have said a word by themselves. They, by simple exposure, learn uh, the elements of English. Furthermore, a, in a biologically important aspect of language development is maturation, physical maturation. We know that uh, a child is incapable of acquiring language, no matter how much training you give, how much exposure before the age of roughly for, uh, uh, eight months. Uh, there is no way of conditioning or training a child at this age to speak, even understandings. Uh, it has nothing to do with articulation. He cannot learn to understand. But then, uh, without changing your treatment of the growing child in any way, a time comes when understanding sets in you have spoken to the child from the day it was born, suddenly uh, you begin to notice that there's some evidence that what you're saying seems to make some difference in the child, and soon the child will begin to speak by himself. Understanding always precedes uh, production. So maturation is a very important factor, and I have elsewhere shown that uh, the onset of language is uh, quite closely correlated with maturation of events in the brain, but I stress that the correlation is not the same as showing cause and effect. All we can say is there's some relationship between it, but exactly what has to mature, we have yet to discover. Uh, obviously, exposure to language is a necessity. It's so obvious we hardly need to waste um, any words on this, except that the exposure to language does not have to be auditory. It can also be through another medium, as I've pointed out before. The example of Helen Keller is the best one, where language was uh, morse coded or something of the sort uh, into uh, the growing child's hand, and language developed promptly and very rapidly. Furthermore, uh, there's good evidence that there is a critical period for language acquisition, that the child who does not acquire language within a uh, specific time period, namely before roughly age 12, has a great difficulty in acquiring, and unfortunately I don't have time to give you the details, but they uh, can easily be found. Uh, we find then that uh, language uh, functioning has to do with something in the brain. We can be much more specific, and we know that language function can be eliminated uh, specifically by certain interference uh, with the brain. Uh, most uh, uh, important there is the other lesions uh, that cause 
language deficits without altering the individual in other ways. You have uh, persons who uh, suffer wounds in the head that primarily interfere with their speaking capacity. This is called aphasia. But uh, this does not uh, render the individual incapable of new learning. They continue to learn. They continue to form associations, to uh, draw conclusions, to be intelligent. In fact, uh, intelligence tests show barely any difference in many patients who are aphasic. Uh, so that the only or main function that is being interfered with is language. And once more, we are reminded that there must be something rather specific in human brains that uh, serves uh, language. Also, uh, there can be uh, interference, systemic interference, with language function. This, however, is in most cases not specific to language, although some drugs have been proposed that they act more specifically on language function uh, than on other functions. Um, this has been used partly in uh, uh, treatment of patients who are mute, uh, schizophrenic patients who are given a uh, special drug, uh, sodium amytal, a barbiturate, and through a short period, uh, these patients are, are uh, brought into a stage when they begin to speak quite spontaneously. Also, other interference, drug intoxicating interferences um, are on record that interfere with language. In these cases, usually, other aspects of judgment are altered also. Uh, altered also. Uh, I think there's one uh, well-known and tested drug called Martini, which um, interferes with language functions quite considerably. Uh, well, uh, one could prolong this uh, list and show that uh, we know something in, from one point of view very little, from another point of view considerable amount, uh, about language function and the brain. And we know that uh, language must be a well-integrated activity. It's a brain activity. Uh, and we know it's associated with human brains. Now, let me say a few words about uh, cognition, or more specifically, recognition, because uh, language is entirely predicated on the assumption that the individual who uses it has a peculiar form of recognition. Uh, let me give you the uh, problem in a technological setting. Supposing I have a uh, blind person, I want to construct a machine for this blind person that does some recognizing for him. Let us say the machine recognizes steps down, and it um, is, I hold it in my hand, and the machine scans the environment and gives some kind of a signal. Now, uh, such machines have been constructed. Uh, they are usually not very helpful. Uh, but uh, quite a bit of effort went into pattern recognizers, also as prosthetic equipment. And uh, a machine that would function well uh, would be one uh, which uh, the uh, blind person holds, and it begins to make one signal when there is a step. All right. Uh, you could also think of brains, animals, as machines of this sort. And in fact, if we want to be physiologists who understand what brains actually do, how cognition works, this is the kind of approach we are forced to take. We would uh, like to assume that there is some kind of a mechanism, that uh, this mechanism gives a, a single signal for a variety of instances that it scans, and in fact, an infinite <laughs> variety. It's an um, entirely open class. And each time that such an instance is observed, uh, the apparatus, the uh, mechanism, gives one signal. And we, as observers, may uh, find that this signal is a particular type of response. It, uh, the frog may uh, jump uh, to a endless variety of flies, but that is uh, endless. Um, it has bounds. The class of flies that it, or insects that it might uh, jump to 
will have bounds, but within these bounds, there's an infinity of points, and uh, his nervous system always responds as, uh, go get it, and jump on it. Uh, all right, if we try to think a little bit further along these lines, we can postulate that this mechanism uh, could not be simply a transducing mechanism where everything that it sees is simply translated into a different language, if you wish. In other words, the machine is not simply one that uh, says uh, it gets, it's getting lighter and lighter and lighter, or darker and darker and darker, because this does never result in the kind of classification and categorization that we see animals to perform, as well as humans to perform, particularly in language. Uh, it would have to be a machine that somehow says all of this is one class. How would such a machine look? Dr. Mahler proposed yesterday, he was talking about a mechanism very similar to this, and he used the term template, something like a stencil. Now, uh, we can conceive of a mechanism that is a template uh, that has some of these properties. If it is a rigid template, uh, then in fact, uh, uh, it could presumably, uh, or a filter, allow a whole variety of instances that fit its contours to pass, and whenever an instance come, instant come, comes uh, that is too large, it will reject it. This is the principle of an egg sorting machine or something of the sort. Now, when Dr. Mahler used the word template, I'm sure he meant it in a much more general way. And let me specify now one particular aspect of the generalization that we need for the notion. Actually, it cannot be a rigid template, but the machine uh, that we must postulate to exist in a wide variety of animals, probably all animals, would have to have the peculiar property of seeing relationships so it is not concerned with individual aspects, but it is concerned with invariances in the relationship. It always uh, reports, makes a statement on a certain relationship is present, bigger than, lighter than, uh, or actually much more complex relationships than this. And the formal label that I'd like to give to this idea, seeing relationships, the formal label is going to be computation. It's a machine that computes. And so recognition can be perfectly properly said to be a computing activity, and it's based on computations. Uh, now, uh, there are two aspects that we must remember, must keep in mind. Uh, I could elaborate on this much more. Unfortunately, there's not enough time. But I want, to, want you to remember two things. First is that brains are very different, one from the other, from species to species. This is not to say that uh, there is not also a common denominator. We know from taxonomy that animals are arrangeable in a certain way that you see general patterns of Evolvement, uh, and this gives us the clues of how to range them taxonomically. At the same time, the very word notion of species is that every species has characteristics. And as you study uh, neuroanatomy, you find that you will never find two species with exactly the same brain. In fact, even individuals differ in their uh, configuration, especially true of man. But uh, the variations of brains within man are much smaller uh, than the variations across species. Together with the neuroanatomical differences, the species-specific differences in brains, we also find differences in the computations that these brains can do. Now, this may be fancy language, but you can verify this quite easily and naturally. If you go to one environment, let us say a pond in the woods, where there are many different organisms, you will find that in that same pond, one animal will respond peculiarly to one set of stimuli that leaves the other animal totally disinterested. Or if you want to run very exact experiments, you can find that for one species, there is a range of similarities, which for the other species, is not a similarity at all. In other words, where one animal sees similarities, another animal sees differences. Uh, 
In, other, in our other and earlier terminology, we can say that brains have different computations. Don't ask me how. Nobody knows how the computations take place. There must be some analog mechanisms and biochemical terms. We are not concerned with this. The facts are, it's not an assumption, the facts are that these various brains have different computing facilities. And there are many, many reasons you could give why this has to be so. Uh, uh, one is that the biochemical constituents are quite uh, different. We, uh, we don't, again, have to go into fine details of this. So two consequences follow from this uh, ridiculously short survey of um, recognition. First consequence is that there are species differences uh, in general. The second co consequence is, uh, or conclusion, is that recognition is a computational activity. Computation of what? Computation of relations. Relational computations take place. All right, now let's uh, make use of this notion and apply it to language and go back to our to the language that I have on the board, what takes place? We find that uh, every aspect of the language that we are going, that we have here, and the sentences that can be produced, are nothing but relations. There are, in fact, uh, no other elements but the uh, computations themselves. If you, if there's anything discrete, it is only the mode of computation, much the way you, if, uh, arithmetic may have the elements of uh, certain operations, addition and multiplication, if you wish. And apart from that, you have nothing but relations, which is an argument that you can, in fact, uh, pursue also in arith arithmetic. And this is being done all the time. Let's see what kind of relationships you have. Uh, recall the sentence uh, that you had on the board yesterday in the evening. Uh, John is uh, certain to leave, I believe it was. Well, um, in the question period, uh, a diagram was put on the board, which looked like a tree arrangement and was rather complicated. Now, remember that this diagram actually told you, in diagrammatic form, relationships between the forms. And in fact, uh, in this sentence, we discovered uh, another sentence is embedded. First of all, that there is something that is certain. What is certain? A certain sentence is certain. What is the sentence uh, that John is leaving? John uh, is about to leave. That was the other, other sentence. Uh, in every sentence, there's a further relationship. That's what makes it a sentence. We have defined it that way, namely that there's a topic and a comment. Most of these words come from Dr. Chomsky's uh, theories. But what interests us here is that as we approach these structures, sentences, what we actually do is see relationships, or in other words, we perform computations on these patterns. So we, the first kind of computation is to ask, what is the subject and what's the predicate? And we might go on then and ask, uh, what are these various words in it? Uh, we go down this tree that was uh, shown on the board. It turns out that in fact, even though in theory it looks as you, if you came to an end point and those are the elements, namely the words, if you take now the words, what do you have? You have again webs of relationships. And uh, this can best be grasped uh, if we think once more of an animal situation. I have here words such as on and up, uh, down, under, small and big. Now what is required is that somehow the animal learns onness, upness, highness, and so on. And I think any animal trainer will uh, agree with me that these are extremely difficult things to get across, even intelligent chimpanzees. Efforts like this have been done. The best example is uh, the odd one. There's uh, a set of experiments uh, done by Harlow, where the monkey has to choose out of an array of things uh, that one stimulus that is different from all the others. So the word, if you wish, or the concept, doesn't matter, the relationship, is different from or the odd one. Uh, this is one of the few things that have been, tra have been successfully trained. 
uh, whereas a great many other words have been tried and uh, nothing of the kind ever can be demonstrated. Now, uh, it, uh, we should not believe that the so-called concrete words are any different. Uh, take the word that Washoe knows, brush. It would be very interesting, it's possible. I have no doubt, in fact, that uh, some aspect like this is, is maybe true. I don't know, I'd have to be convinced by a demonstration. But what would be necessary to demonstrate that the word brush has been established rather than a trick is that you can introduce any old brush at any time and it's always a brush. Uh, the book that was published by the Hayes, I think it was called The Ape in Our House, um, uh, this was the first uh, effort to teach a uh, chimpanzee English and they used uh, uh, oral language. Uh, here, the loving mother, Mrs. Hayes, describes um, how her uh, stepchild, Vicky, uh, was uh, smart in her language uh, comprehension. And uh, she gives the example that uh, when uh, Vicky loved to go to the movies, uh, when uh, Vicky was told in the evening, Vicky, want to go to the movies? She'd immediately rush to the clothes closet and get her bonnet and get all decked out for the occasion. But um, Mrs. Hayes regrets that in the morning, if she says in the same tone of voice, Vicky, want to go to the movies? No comprehension whatsoever. In other words, there was a whole sequence and setting, and we don't, in fact, know what kinds of computations the animal performed on the sentence. I am not denying the intelligence or capacity or computational facilities in other animals, in, uh, in other forms but humans. The question, however, is, what are the similarities in these comp uh, computational facilities? Uh, my time is running somewhat short. Uh, I uh, want to uh, make one point before uh, trying to summarize. Uh, what goes on when we have word labels? I must introduce another notion, and that is the notion of tolerance, not in a moral sense, but in a formal sense, mathematical sense. Um, there is a characteristic aspect in which animals compute or respond to environments. I can uh, illustrate it best in the following way. Supposing we have a stimulus continuum uh, let it be uh, sounds or sight. Uh, these might be uh, wavelength. Let us make it uh, uh, light, uh, light waves. And these would be the thresholds. The uh, uh, extreme, this would be violet, and the other extreme is red. And uh, the threshold then means that the animal can see light waves within this range. Now, ordinarily, let us take man, we know that uh, this has an infinity of points, this continuum, and we can arrange two points such that you can just still see that uh, these are two different colors, and we can narrow these two points. A little closer still, from the back you may not see what I'm doing, but I could choose two points that are distinct, yet they are not perceptible anymore to the human eye, and in which case you say, uh, this difference is not noticeable, all right, now let's take an animal that is less, uh, has less acuity and uh, make the just noticeable difference, or J and D, or the tolerance, much larger, this large. Now, uh, we can keep the threshold in the two animals the same. Both animals now see light in this range. Any point presented can be responded to, but this new hypothetical animal, uh, when given uh, this point and this point cannot see any difference. It can just see that it's light, but cannot tell that one is different from the other. Whereas any point that is at least this far apart from each other can be told apart. Now, uh, imagine a, a new animal that has a tolerance on this set of points or a just noticeable difference, which is identical with the threshold. This animal again, can see an infinity of points, but it can never tell that there's one color is different from the other. All it can tell is there is light or there's no light. Uh, 
there are many interesting formal properties of this, and this is called, uh, called technically a tolerance uh, and has given rise to a uh, special branch in mathematics in, or in topology uh, by uh, a mathematician, Zeeman, Christopher Zeeman, who wrote a topology of tolerance spaces. But uh, I just want you to remember the notion of tolerance here. We can apply this now to a different notion, uh, uh, namely to the range of relations that a brain is capable of. Every relation that it sees is related to some operation, and uh, there are presumably only as many operations possible as the animal is equipped for biologically. So you have a set of uh, relationships which are there. And if you have a word now, table, uh, we can say that what characterizes a table is certain types of relationships. Namely, it has to be flat. You uh, may sit at it. Uh, and a number of things of the sort, maybe it has four legs. Now you could list all of these relationships, and this would be a subset in this uh, general set of relationships. But as it turns out, the notion of tolerance is highly applicable here because uh, we have a tolerance on this set, each one of us. We do not have to know exactly the relationships that are implied. It's only some of these relationships, and this can move around. Now this is a very important fact. Think of the notion house. Uh, there are certain relationships that characterize houseness, but because of this notion of tolerance, because you can move around, you can easily extend the notion house to the house of David, uh, the house of lords, uh, the house of cards. You can metaphorize, and we do this all the time. In fact, this is the most powerful aspect of creativity, as Dr. Chomsky mentioned. And you do it by simply keeping some of the relationships uh, that are generally accepted and add a few other relationships. And because we all are humans, we can easily make the shift um, and follow uh, this creative part. Now, uh, from this notion, we get a new insight. And that is that a word between us is not a uh, an object that I uh, bring to another person. It's a very different procedure. What we have is a community of computers, if you wish, uh, a community of brains, and the word merely labels some of the possible computations. So what the word actually does is, at one time there was some kind of adjustment, all the word can do is cause the other computer to be computing along the same lines. Uh, oddly enough, a notion that comes quite close to what Dr. Kaplan mentioned this morning, you don't have a dead transmission as through a telephone, and the engineering terms that have been fashionable some 15 years ago, or were fashionable some 15 years ago, are peculiarly inapplicable to language communication. Communication is an act, language communication, in which you have to have brains that can operate in exactly the same way. Now, because of this, we now have a new reason to be highly skeptical of language communication across species. Um, and uh, maybe I come back to a point that I made at the beginning of my talk, uh, that it is true that by scholarship, we have good reasons not to want to invest money into research on language communication. But uh, if you want to or not, by way of summary, we can say the following about language communication um, in a more general way. First of all, whether there is language communication or not is not uh, characterized by the number of items in the language, or to put it in different words, if we hear that uh, Rosho, the chimpanzee, has uh, 200 items, as some people have claimed, uh, other people uh, who have observed the animal uh, have been much more modest. Uh, Dr. Mahler, I think, only thought there were 50, if I remember correctly, what he said. Uh, actually, the number of items is quite irrelevant. It does not measure whether there's language communication or not. 20 items would be quite enough. 
Uh, you could use the notion of a symbol. This can be interpreted in various ways. Uh, some of the interpretations of a symbol comes very close to what I've just said, and in that respect, there would be agreement. But other interpretations of symbol, namely something has to stand for something else, is so vague, it certainly doesn't characterize language at all. There's no reason why we should deny this capacity to animals, and there are many instances where something can for stand for some, something else, and animals can learn that. Only it has nothing to do with language. Spontaneous formation, very little to do. It's not a criterion to decide whether language communication exists or not. What about combination? Again and again we hear that the one thing the animal, we always hear, cannot do and man can, is combine items. Actually, combination is not much of a criterion. You can get a random machine that combines items and just puts out uh, items randomly. That's a combination, it follows a rule, namely randomness. Or it can have a rule such as we heard yesterday. It can always use combine items by a certain way. Combination by itself is nothing unique, in fact, in the animal kingdom. Every movement uh, is a combination of muscular uh, contractions. And these contractions can be recombined. And every animal does that. So there is this analogy but it has very little to do with language. Combination is not a good criterion. Whether it's auditory or articulatory, we have seen, has nothing to do with language communication. It's quite irrelevant. And finally, the notion of appropriateness. Can you watch a dog and see whether it appropriately responds to go or come? Has very little to do with language. It's not a good criterion by which to judge whether language communication exists. What is relevant is most of all, the notion of productivity, or what Dr. Chomsky called creativity. Uh, secondly, whether there is a net of relationships that are being computed. And if you think of all these relationships that exist, and the operations as they are formalized, you ought to be able to characterize this whole body of relationships. We call this the structure. And you ought to be able to give a formal characterization of the structure of relationships of one animal and a formal, char and a formal characterization of the structure of relationships of another animal, uh, you would really have to require that these two structures are the same across species. And it's very hard to imagine that you can get communication across species in the absence of this similarity, something that is almost impossible even to conceive. I have a, a note that my summary is at an end, and I have not done what one usually does to let my voice trail out, but I, this is all I have to say. Thank you. I have one question that I'm not, uh, I'm not sure whether uh, you've done full justice to this um, chimpanzee that wanted to go to the movie at night but not in the morning. Isn't it possible it knew, it knew that the movies aren't open in the morning? <laughs> uh, we generally run a tight schedule on this last afternoon and uh, the panel at 3.30. Before that time, we have to have a little discussion about the panel. And uh, we who are involved, or those who are involved in the preparation for next year's conference, want to pick the brains of the people who are here. So I think I'm going to suggest that you write the question that you may have, pass it to the aisle, and the ushers will pick them up but we'll not at this point respond to the questions. We'll, let, we'll turn them over to uh, Dr. Lenneberg for his <coughs> for background as he <coughs> prepares for the panel. <coughs>